Okay, good morning everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for our uh, July City Efficiency Leadership Council webinar. Um, really excited to um, have this conversation today on equity and climate planning um, in Texas. <clears throat> and really um, glad to welcome our speakers and um, thought readers in this race. So again, as, as I always start these, for those of you who are new to City Efficiency Leadership Council, we are an education and outreach program of the State Energy Conservation Office. Um, and we are a collaborative network of public sector entities in Texas working on um, sharing of best practices around energy management, but also increasingly around resilience, um, climate, uh, and other topics that are um, increasingly important to um, public sector folks in Texas. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, um, just shoot me an email or we have some upcoming events um, in the next few weeks that are really great opportunities to learn more about our work. Speaking of those, so our next CELC webinar will be um, on August 27th, that is somewhat tentative, but I think that's where we'll land. And we're going to be talking about financing energy efficiency. This is actually a presentation I've been putting together for another workshop, but um, I thought it was some content that uh, would be really valuable to anyone who isn't able to attend this other workshop happening next week. So um, that would be August 27th, 9 to 10. And then, as I mentioned, we have a lightning round of City Efficiency Leadership Council roundtables. Of course, all of this is virtual at this point, um, and we are hoping to go back to an in-person context when it is safe to do so. Um, so uh, we're going to start uh, that circuit with uh, our North Central Texas roundtable, and we're going to have the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute come share their research around energy burden, energy poverty, and efficiency potential. And so kind of continuing the conversation we're starting today. Our Gulf Coast um, meeting will be on August 20th, and we are going to have some folks come talk about the Fortified Building Code, which is a resilient building code um, standard, and generally talking about resilience um, and passive survivability in buildings along the Gulf Coast. Central Texas is still to be determined, so any of you uh, Central Texas folks, if you have burning topics or speakers that you think would be um, valuable to plug into that, let me know. And that should be coming together pretty soon. Since these are online, they are open statewide. Um, they are still only for public sector audience, um, so we do ask vendors and service providers to create space um, in those meetings for us to talk privately, um, but uh, we are, I am opening that up to anyone across the state who wants to join for any of those. So join the Gulf Coast, join for North Texas, whatever piques your interest. Um, SPEAR has also transitioned our building operator certification training to an online format. Um, and we are trying to get a course put together for the fall. Um, and this again can also be participants from across the state. Um, previously, this was all in-person um, training, so the online gives us a lot more possibility. If you have any of your own announcements, um, or as we're going through our presentations today, if you have questions for our speakers or for me, please use the chat box. I will be following that along. Oh, actually, the question and answer box. Sorry, it doesn't look like the chat box is, is on here. Um, so I will be following along in those questions and answers and make sure we get um, those answers towards the end. So today we're talking about equity and climate planning, but I just want to sort of review why do we talk about equity? When must we talk about equity when we talk about climate change? Um, and many of the presenters today will also cover similar concepts, but um, really just wanted to reiterate that climate change does affect everyone, but it does not affect communities equally. Low income and communities of color experience a disproportionate impact from climate change, including the deleterious effects um, that I've listed there, and generally have fewer resources and fewer access to leadership and representation in order to affect the processes that both create the climate crisis and also impact resilience and um, uh, mitigation of, of climate crisis. 
Um, but fortunately, as we will see and learn today, designing solutions that meet the needs of the most um, needed communities will also inherently benefit everyone. Um, but we do need to have the explicit focus on trying to um, take an equity lens in our thinking about climate. So um, that's why I wanted to bring together our speakers today because each of their communities and each of their cities have really um, thought about these questions and um, attempted to uh, address them in their climate planning efforts. <clears throat> So these are the four plans we're going to be talking about today, as well as um, many of the efforts around surrounding those plans. Um, a couple things I wanna mention, first of all, there are so many amazing and excellent climate efforts happening across the state. Many of you on the call are leading those efforts. Um, I want to make sure that I acknowledge that, you know, this is not the extent of the climate and equity work happening in the state. This is just who we are bringing together today in the conversation. I also want to note that <clears throat> because of our limited time, our speakers are going to touch on key aspects of the work in their climate planning, but um, a lot of the strategies and efforts and implementation that you might see featured in one or the other may be present across the board, but I've really asked our speakers to kind of hone in on certain aspects of the work. So, you know, don't think that this is all inclusive and also don't think that, um, you know, that there's there are key things missing. Um, so with that, um, i quickly introduce our speakers and then we'll jump right in. So we're going to start with Phoebe Romero, uh, Environmental Program Coordinator from the City of Austin, Office of Sustainability, and then Katie Evans, Climate Coordinator with the City of Dallas, Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Blair Cottingham, Chief of Staff and Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Houston. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with Derek Melnick, Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of San Antonio. Thank you all again for being here. And with that, Phoebe, if you want to jump in. Um, and again, uh, just a reminder to everyone, uh, the chat or question and answer function is where um, you should put your questions and then we'll get to questions at the end. We do not have time to put questions in between each session. Okay, Phoebe, go for it. Hi, um, hello. So I'm going to kick us off and I'll apologize in advance for speaking quickly. Just have a lot to, to get through and I want to keep us on time. Um, so I want to go ahead and start us off with um, defining equity as we do in the city of Austin. Um, and so uh, our equity office has uh, done a lot of work around um, racial equity in the past uh, for years and um, basically racial equity is the condition when race no longer predicts a person's quality of life outcomes in the city. And so we focus on race um, because we see it as a, a primary factor of these determinants. And so that's not to say that other factors don't um, affect quality of life, but that um, race is primary and that it is also a compounding factor with others. And so in order to create an equitable process, um, we really went through um, several you know, aspects. We coordinated with the equity office to um, think about our process and to recruit members into our steering committee and advisory groups. And so when we had a 2015 plan, um, it was really you know, having uh, these large environmental organizations that are typically in these plants and this time we really wanted to expand and you know include of course the environmental advocacy organizations uh, big green organizations technical experts but we also wanted to make sure that we had um, community organizers in this process who focused on equity and social justice and had that language and that we're interested in climate as well and so um, you know we can always be better we can always be more diverse but we really try to make sure that our, our groups um, represented um, different organizations and different perspectives. Um, then we also created a community climate ambassadors program. People, some uh, representing, you know, 
working as an individual some through their organization um, and they had they were tasked with um, you know a trend attending an equity training like all participants um, interviewing uh, members of their networks through uh, gatherings or through one-on-one -on -one interviews or through small interviews obviously a lot of the work that they had planned got derailed due, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and so um, they did a great job at adjusting to a virtual setting and having these meetings through zoom but um, um, you know, it, it would be, um, we do have to acknowledge that some of that work and some of the timelines and everything was affected by this. Um, we also had an equity workshop for all of our steering committee advisory group and ambassador participants. And um, this was facilitated by um, Dr. Tane Ward, who has an organization called Equilibrio Norte that focuses on environmental justice and indigenous rights. And um, that was really helpful for really um, kicking us off on learning about the history of Austin, redlining history, environmental justice history, and um, really giving us a dialogue for how to um, identify aspects of white organizational culture um, to help us really evaluate how we were having conversations. Um, and then we also created an equity screening tool evaluation for um, our strategies and our goals. And that was done um, in you know, collaboration with our steering committee. And we also looked at a lot of other cities, um, including the city of San Antonio and their screening tool, um, looked at the Green Lining Institute's guidelines, um, Providence. You know, we talked to a lot of different cities to try to um, you know, take uh, inspiration from these and then adapt it based on um, what our, our steering committee gave us feedback on. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention that we did compensate um, our ambassadors for their work and uh, members of the steering committee and advisory groups that, um, you know, felt like they needed that compensation. Obviously, you know, when your work is in the environmental field, you can get paid for participating in this, but that's not the case for everybody. So we wanted to acknowledge that. And um, lastly, we did have uh, child supervision and meal available at our public community workshops. Um, and so when we were putting together um, the equity tool, we kind of, you know, focused on themes, which is what other cities have done, and really um, honed in on these seven, which are health, affordability, accessibility, uh, just transition, community capacity, and cultural preservation um, and, and accountability, which is super important. Um, and so each of these had about three or four um, screening questions that looked at, you know, when, when it comes to health, um, what are the you know potential impacts when it comes to air pollution mental health impacts from um, you know having stress involved with energy burden for example um, just transition really looked to add um, workforce development and making sure that we're developing a um, a diverse workforce um, and so um, you know each of these was uh, you know, its own conversation and, uh, you know, something to, to remember with these is that we didn't, we don't have all the answers, but that part of the process was just really thinking through these carefully. And um, when we wrote our strategies, we really wanted to make sure that we were prioritizing low income communities and communities of color. And so um, when thinking about a process of how we were going to incorporate this tool, um, we looked at the Government Alliance on Race and Equities process for equity, which starts off with acknowledging history. Um, and that's really what our equity workshop aimed to do, is to think about Austin history, think about redlining, think about some of the moments that have effects right now that you know are leading to uh, gentrification, for example. Um, and then really try to collect as much demographic data as we could to really figure out like where the inequities are, um, what type of inequities we see in all of these different um, aspects. Um, and then when we were writing our goal, it was really to aim to think about, you know, this is a carbon reduction goal, a climate goal, but it also is a goal that can help us um, achieve equity. Um, and then uh, we developed strategies of how we would get there based on that. Um, and then the biggest and most important part of this is that the equity tool really helped us review and revise and really thinking about this as an iterative process where we're writing something down, we're evaluating it, we're rewriting it, making it better each time. And we're still in that process right now. Um, and then lastly, something that we're really thinking about now is, you know, how do we ensure uh, accountability within and outside of, of our organization? How do we communicate results, make sure we're connecting, uh, collecting the right data, measuring, et cetera. 
Um, and so some of the reflections from that were that, you know, we did develop a scoring mechanism for this, but at the end of the day, it wasn't about, you know, the strategy is a 15 or this is a 14, you know, that didn't really matter. What mattered was that the process of going through the tool and trying to think of like potential negative impacts and how we could address those was really the most important part. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, it wasn't, I, I mean, the, the scoring was useful, but at the end of the day, um, the biggest and most important part was really having those conversations. Um, we also acknowledge that, you know, we don't have everybody at the table and that, you know, we as a group try to go through these responses, but that the responses of some community members, especially those most impacted, may be different. Um, and then another key takeaway was that, you know, we really need to integrate programs and initiatives more closely because silos do hurt equity. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of ongoing challenges that we need to keep thinking about, including displacement, disproportionate cause, funding, feedback mechanisms, and streamlining data, data collection processes um, across the board. And so these are just some of the, the key takeaways that we took from the process. Um, and so we did have a community ambassadors or climate ambassadors program. Um, you know, we mentioned that they had gatherings, interviews, um, and, you know, they did a great job of, of pulling through and doing these virtually, which was great. Um, and so some of the things that we heard, we're still organizing everything, but, you know, their a clean and healthy environment was really important to, to the groups that we heard, as was diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, a lot of folks talked about climate hazard preparedness. You know, I'm worried about heat, I'm worried about drought, um, I'm worried about, you know, flooding. All of these issues were, were really prominent um, that came up. And then, of course, barriers. Um, you know, I talked about displacement, housing affordability, gentrification, homelessness. All of these were big issues that kept coming up as, as um, things that they were concerned with and then racism and equity and exclusion so you know the opposite of, of DEI which is that um, folks felt like you know their culture was being lost due to displacement like businesses were closing um, that had been historically important so really thinking about that cultural um, uh, uh, conservation aspect uh, preservation aspect um, and then lastly lack of information access came up a lot like I'm really um, you know I'm really interested in this issue, but I've never heard about it before. How can I get more involved, you know, and really thinking about how the government maybe hasn't done the best job of, of reaching out to some of these communities. And so we'll summarize, um, you know, we have 17 goals that are, are meant to be by 2030 and we have several strategies um, involved in those goals. And so what we tried to do to center equity throughout was to really prioritize incentives and target communications at um, low income communities and communities of color. Um, you know, try to really think about anti displacement, you know, we don't have the answer, but it's something that it's come up so much that we need to continue to think about this. Um, just transition, again, making sure that there's training and jobs um, for these new industries and technologies. Um, prioritizing health benefits in the Eastern Crescent, that's where we see a lot of these um, um, dis disparities is, um, through the Eastern Crescent of the city. And then um, lastly, to continue to center communities of color in ongoing um, learning and studies. Um, and so just as, you know, some, some concluding thoughts, we, we really can't do this alone. Obviously, you know, the city has an important role to play and we've made efforts to take in the community. But something that we've been thinking about is really moving from inclusion of community input to community ownership, um, really making sure that we're building relationships, sustaining partnerships and aligning with other causes so that we have um, you know, community that's really advocating for these issues and, and holding us accountable and, um, you know, making sure that uh, this is a community wide effort. And of course, that includes uh, collaboration with the private sector and making sure that we um, have everybody involved at the table and that we have funding to make all of these things happen as well. And so just to give you an overview of, of the schedule, um, we have, so right now we are in, um, we do have a draft that's being reviewed by our, um, you know, different departments and our steering committee and advisory groups. Um, and then the goal is that in the coming month, we are going to be um, actually releasing a draft for public comment and going to all of our boards and commissions and, and visiting with them and letting them know. Um, and this is, you know, all of the environmental related board, but also the quality of life boards and, and anybody who's a stakeholder that could be, 
who could be interested in this um, draft. And so that'll be the coming month. And then finally, the goal is to finalize everything, get a um, design ready and have it uh, presented to council in the fall. Um, and so thank you very much. Um, if you all have any questions, we do have um, a austintexas.gov slash climate plan is where you can find more information. And we do have a Speak Up Austin page. And so um, when I share the slides, these will be linked. Um, but yeah, I know we're doing questions at the end. So thank you all. Um, and I'll go ahead and you know stop sharing my screen for the next presenter. Great, thanks, Phoebe. And Katie, you are up next. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, look, you look good. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, my name is Katie Evans. I am the climate coordinator for City of Dallas. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan, or CCAP, which was newly adopted by our city council just um, in May, about two months ago. So on the 27th, it was unanimously adopted and we are very excited to kick off implementation. Uh, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about the background in protecting frontline communities by reducing risk, inclusive engagement and in our process, and then briefly about our equitable implementation process moving forward. So like Phoebe, I'm going to talk pretty quickly because I've got a lot to get through. So at its core, the mission of CCAP is uh, with equity and inclusion as core values. The CCAP proposes solutions that will improve our natural environment, our educational and economic outcomes, the affordability of our housing stock and our transportation systems. So you will see these uh, core values reflected in the eight sectors of CCAP as well as our 97 action items. So let's talk about protecting our frontline communities. What do I mean by frontline communities? It's quite literally the communities who are at the front line of climate change. These are the communities that experience the impacts first and have the least ability to be resilient to the impacts of climate change. It's not necessarily historically disadvantaged communities. It might be children, older adults, low income communities and communities of color. So like many cities in Texas and across the country, uh, Dallas is going to be experiencing uh, some significant climate changes moving forward. Uh, more extreme heat, an increase in average temperature, uh, poor air quality that will be exacerbated by increasing heat, as well as flooding and drought. And just in the year uh, we were developing the CCAP, Dallas experienced some straight line windstorms, as well as a couple tornadoes that did pretty serious damage to our city. So you've already seen this graphic and I'm sure you've seen it many times before. We know that everyone, as Cassidy said, is going to be impacted by climate change, but not everyone will be impacted equitably. And we know that equality doesn't mean equity and that the communities that have the least means to adapt will be disproportionately impacted. So we wanted to focus our community engagement on increasing access to information for those neighborhoods that have not been quite as involved in the planning process historically. And we wanted to work with them moving forward through implementation to ensure that our CCAP efforts lead to those equitable outcomes. It doesn't help the city of Dallas to just benefit one neighborhood. We want every part of Dallas to benefit from this plan equitably. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to work towards environmental justice? We're looking at the intersection of mitigation, adaptation, and environmental quality. So we want to reduce emissions, uh, manage the risks of climate change, and improve sustainability and quality of life in order to prioritize those communities that are most impacted or in need across all of our 97 action items. And we did this with a data-driven approach. Uh, these maps reflect three of our uh, equity indicators. And this really helped us focus our efforts to mitigate exposure to harm and increase access to opportunity. So our engagement process was pretty uh, in, involved and inclusive. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So when we were uh, tasked with creating this plan, we were asked to create an effective and equitable plan. Equity is a primary focus across all city departments and programs and budgets. It's 
reflected in our core service values at the city of Dallas. And in fact, at the bottom left corner of the screen, you'll see the two little guys giving each other a high five. That's the symbol that we use for equity at the city of Dallas. So it's consistent across all of our programs and processes. So we know that inclusive engagement increases public participation. It creates more public trust and confidence in the government. It results in more informed residents and improved relationships with neighborhoods and increases community contributions to shared outcomes. We know that an engaged and involved community is a community that has ownership of the plan and will improve the program's success going forward. So how did we do this? How did we reach uh, such a wide range of neighborhoods and communities within the city of Dallas. We held two rounds of six in-person community meetings with over 100 additional requested community meetings. Essentially, if an organization wanted the city of Dallas to come talk about CCAP, the city of Dallas went to talk about CCAP. Anyone and everyone who wanted to speak with us got to. We had a number of um, online surveys for both residents and businesses. We had a wonderful meeting in a box toolkit. This allowed any resident to hold a meeting about CCAP in the comfort of their own home, which was really helpful when we're talking about uh, communities or neighborhoods that maybe don't want a government official in their community center. So this allowed us to reach a wider range of individuals we also had a social media toolkit that included consistent branding and tailored information, as well as press releases. And of course, we streamed our meetings online and posted them on our website. So like I said, we went to anyone and everyone who asked, everyone from churches to educational institutions, nonprofits, and businesses. We presented all over uh, North Texas really out even outside of our city limits. So this map here reflects uh, where we presented on CCAP in 2019 from February through November. I do want to point out that a lot of these dots actually represent multiple meetings and this is only meetings that occurred within the city limits. So um, as you can see, we were able to reach a wide range of people and we actually got to have multiple meetings in every single council district. So we really made a huge effort with our outreach. And as a result, we saw some really great results on our fall 2019 online survey. So some of these zip codes that are blue are zip codes that are typically not as engaged with the city. And so we believe that this was a direct reflection of our outreach efforts. So here's the numbers, by the numbers. We, uh, like I said, have only been working on implementation for about two months. So most of this timeline was the development and the finalization of our CCAP. So over the course of the year uh, during development, we had um, those dozen formal meetings as well as uh, several hundred informal events and online responses. And then through our online platform, we obtained uh, 6,400 community suggestions. So as you can imagine, it was uh, pretty involved with our response. We also had two stakeholder groups. We had an external stakeholder advisory committee and then our internal environmental planning task force. I do wanna point out that the most important thing isn't necessarily the numbers for us. What we really are proud of is our extensive access and opportunity, making it available to communities that are historically not as engaged in the process. We were able to really reach as many of those communities as um, feasible. So this as a result turned into our climate action plan. And so I'll speak real briefly about our equitable implementation plans. So the CCAP itself has eight sectors and 97 action items. One of the things I really like about this um, uh, plan is the way it's laid out, right? And so I do wanna point out, we have 11 action items that are directly tied to environmental justice most of which are slated for implementation within the first two years of the plan. And so when you look at our actual plan, it's laid out in a way that's very easy to read. So if you look at each action item, each action item has a primary benefit listed as well as co-benefits. And so when you're glancing at it, you can see immediately what each individual action item is tied to. And additionally, any action item that has equity considerations has that called out specifically. So anyone who comes along, if, if 
10 years down the road, someone wants to take a look at our plan, e they can easily see what the equity considerations and what they need to do to make sure this is implemented in an equitable fashion. So again, moving forward with implementation, we'll continue to focus on our vulnerable communities, continue to engage with stakeholders and evaluate and report our progress on our website. We will also continue to work with our Office of Equity, which has a great report on equity indicators within the city of Dallas. And with that, I'll turn it over to our next presenter. Thank you so much. My contact information and our website is on the bottom right corner of your screen. Thank you, Katie. And um, all contact information will be shared um, in the follow-up email as well as slide deck and recordings. So, okay, Lara, your turn. Hello. All right. So thank you so much. My name is Laura Cottingham. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Houston. And um, it is fabulous to be here today and hear about the great things that all of the cities in Texas are doing. Um, I tried to talk about something a little bit different from Houston because we've done a, a lot of the similar things that you will hear about. So you're gonna see some of the same slides also that have been shared, um, but really focusing on Houston's work around climate, around resilience, and around equity. So first and foremost, um, a lot of people are still surprised uh, to hear that the city of Houston, the self-proclaimed and really proud energy capital of the world, is taking action on climate and on climate change. And uh, so much of that um, is a result of, we say Hurricane Harvey, right? Hurricane Harvey in 2017, um, impacted every single Houstonian and Houstonians across the globe. It also set off what feels like a chain of climate events. Um, and it really ushered in this era of people having a greater understanding and importance and sense of urgency around climate action, even in the energy capital of the world. Um, anytime the National Weather Service has to create new colors to show on their map what is happening in Houston, shows you just how huge the situation was. But in Houston, it's not just Harvey, right? It's the series of what we call 500 year storms that we've had every year. And um, in 2015, the Memorial Day flood, in 2016, the tax day flood, in 2017, Hurricane Harvey. 2018, we flooded on the 4th of July. 2019, we flooded, on trop we flooded during Tropical Storm Imelda. And then when I wrote this yesterday, the 2020 dot, 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 there are two storms that look like they might be coming into the Gulf right now impacting Texas. So this is something that Houston has to act on no matter what. We, we can't not at this point. And then also it's so important because cities are the front lines. We are the boots on the ground and the boats in the water. And more and more people are moving into our cities, especially in Texas. So it is so important that cities really begin to start making the plans and acting on them. Um, you've seen this slide a little bit before already, but really talks about how um, in Houston, everyone is impacted by climate change, um, but we have a serious situation where our vo most vulnerable communities are impacted more and they are impacted so frequently that you get into a cycle of never being able to fully recover. And um, we had have had so many storms and so many cases that we are racing to catch up. Um, flooding is just one area of climate that impacts Houston. Uh, there are probably 20 different federal, state, and local agencies working on flooding, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but we, we also often overlook the other impacts that impact our community. Heat is a huge issue. Um, we also have um, communities that are migrating in and out of Houston. We have a whole range of, we talked about tropical diseases that are impacted by Houston. And then what COVID has shown is the connection between climate and community health is absolutely undeniable. It is impacted by heat, it is impacted by weather, I and mean, it's impacted by air quality and pollution. And so right now, I mean, the best thing that we all can do is make sure we are doing as much as we can as fast as we can. 
And in Houston, because we have so many different issues going on at once when we are such a large city and, and some of our issues are just uh, epic proportions, right? When we talk about flooding, when you talk about um, the air quality and the environmental um, and environmental justice impacts of living next to one of the largest petrochemical complexes in the country, it's more than can fit in one plan. And so in Houston, we have multiple different plans happening at once. Um, the climate action plan that my team works on focuses on the long-term strategy to prevent climate change, to try and reduce those greenhouse gas emissions so that global temperature doesn't rise and things don't get worse. There is a separate office that is working specifically on flooding, right? Everyone in Houston knows about flooding, cares about flooding, and wants to work on flooding. And in, 20, in 2020, um, February, the city of Houston launched Resilient Houston, which was our first comprehensive community-wide resilient strategy that really tries to um, be that overarching umbrella that looks at the shocks and stresses and ties um, all of the impacts together, climate being a major impact. And so it looks at more of the adaptation strategy. It looks at what can we do right now to build more resilient communities, um, be they flood resilient, keep resilient, economically resilient, but it also factors in the incredibly crucial equity and social justice component. Because we know that you, you can't have any one of these things, they have to all be done together. So the climate action plan, as you all are probably familiar with, you know, it, it really looks at the greenhouse gas uh, reduction strategy and mitigation, but we talk about the co-benefits because it's not existing in a silo, right? A lot of the strategies that we're working on to reduce those greenhouse gases have direct components that impact environmental justice and community equity. And as we go out into the community, as you, as the previous cities talked about, um, it's really easy for cities to get very wonky and talk about these things like a math equation because we are so heavily driven by data and by metrics because at the end of the day, that's heavily what we are judged on, are our emissions in our community. And that when you're talking to communities and when you're getting that feedback, um, it's so crucially important to talk about and explain and learn why it's important to them. Um, what are their challenges? And how can the things that we as a city are trying to do can make sure that we address their challenges, number one. And so when I talk about the city's complete communities program, you'll see how that plays out in real time. The goal of the climate action plan is carbon neutrality by 2050. And um, we look at different types of strategies through the energy, transportation, buildings, and material sector to reduce those. And what we have always said in Houston is that, um, you know, equity is key to each one of these strategies, and we have to view it as a lens that we used to select the strategies, but most importantly, implement them. Um, in a city as big as Houston, where resources are, we're always constrained, and then when you factor in Harvey and COVID, um, prioritization of projects is crucial. And so when you have decades of issues going on that you are trying to address, in addition to uh, proactively predicting the challenges that we'll face in the future, that the equity strategy and using that as a tool to prioritize will be critical as we move forward in implementing both the climate and the resilient strategy. And so I talked a little bit about the climate action plan up front, but I wanna also talk about resilient Houston, because again, it looks at what are all of the factors at play that we need to do to build resilient neighborhoods, the resilient communities and a resilient Houston. Um, it has a number of strategies that cover an incredibly broad range of topics, but some of the things I wanted to um, point out, because oftentimes when people look at the climate action plan, they have questions about other environmental issues. They have questions about um, adaptation. They have questions about heat. They have questions about environmental justice. But it doesn't mean that it's not in the climate action plan. Again, it's just in, we have, we have a menu of different strategies that encapsulate all of the different action that's going on in Houston. 
And so one of the sections talks about what we're doing in our community um, to make our neighborhoods greener and also cooler. Obviously, this is one that has so many co-benefits that it falls in so many different types of strategies. And all of the parts of the city of Houston are all working on them together and coordinated effort, which is something that is, is hard for cities to do, right? By nature, we are siloed. And in Houston, we are really excited about the progress that we have been making. And you know, if that was spurred on by Harvey, and what we have seen through COVID is that that type of collaboration and that type of team spirit is moving forward even at a faster pace. And Resilient Houston also talks a lot about um, environmental justice in our communities and what can we do. Some of the recommendations which are already happening is the creation of a, a mayor's environmental justice working group that will help coordinate all of the different parts of the city as well as external stakeholders. Um, a lot of the environmental justice issues that our communities face come from different regional jurisdictions. So it's not something that any one entity can address themselves. And um, but we really have to not only just work with the communities, but also work with the um, outlying communities because this is in many cases a regional strategy. Resilient Houston also talks about um, promoting equity policies and programs. And, and this is something where um, other offices have a equity office. Some offices have one office that it does climate action and adaptation. And the city of Houston has a resilience office. We have a, a sustainability office. We have a recovery office. And Resilient Houston calls for creating that same um, equity organization, creating a citywide equity strategy, because it's so important to point out that even though we're all talking about the connection of equity and climate, that equity needs to be baked into every single thing the city worked on. And so um, the mayor's office and the city of Houston are working on a citywide equity strategy but it will directly impact and guide the implementation of the climate action plan, of our recovery efforts, our housing efforts, and everything going forward. And we are planning on increasing equity training opportunities, some of which you heard about, and developing an equity atlas and framework, equity indicators that will be used to um, review and evaluate not just climate actions, but all actions across the city and we are building up ways to track them throughout. So the final thing that I will talk about is the Complete Communities Plan, um, which is uh, Mayor Turner's signature plan for building a more equitable Houston. And very similar to what you saw in Dallas in terms of their data-driven process, when you look at the leading factors um, that indicate economic success, that indicate um, demographic, geographic disparities, access to healthcare and food and transportation and um, clean environment, free and healthy spaces across the board. And in Houston, we already know, and we've done a lot of that um, back work, specific communities throughout the greater Houston community that have been overlooked for decades in terms of all manner of um, economic advancement. And so Complete Communities is the mayor's program and strategy to go to these communities and make sure that we provide a cross-sector approach um, to connect not just the communities, nonprofits, businesses, philanthropic partnerships. And we want to bring everything in the kitchen sink we can um, to bring these communities up uh, to an, an equal and equitable basis with the rest of Houston because we are, we are only as strong as we are together. And the Climate Action Plan implementation uses this complete communities framework as an incredible tool to not only provide information, but get feedback from the communities and those most vulnerable, most vulnerable communities that are incredibly impacted by climate change. And because Houston is so large in terms of population, but also in terms of geography, just getting out into the community is a challenge. And, you know, we had hundreds and hundreds of one-on-one of -on -one meetings. We, similar to Dallas, had an open invitation. Anyone that wanted the city of Houston to come present, we did. Um, and we had meetings all across the city. We partnered with organizations. We had them different days of the week, 
times of the week, whatever we could. And even though it felt like it was a Herculean effort on our part, the number one thing that we realized was it was, it was not enough. It's never going to be enough. And that you can't just do this when you're putting together the plan. And um, the incredible feedback we heard from communities were we, we love this idea. We just learned about it. How can we learn more? And we know that for every person you talk to, there's probably 10 more that you need to talk to. And so we are so incredibly um, thankful for our partners. And we know that moving forward in a COVID era, those partnerships are even more important because our ability to go out into the communities is harder than it ever was before. So I will, um, I will leave with that. And I would also just say that um, an exciting new uh, update that we have just this week is that the city of Houston has officially launched the uh, opened access to our climate action plan implementation working groups. Um, we've had working groups before that worked within the community, but also, also with nonprofits, with um, corporations, with academic universities and schools to try and create the climate action plan. We plan to do the same thing in terms of implementation. And so there's a working group on transportation, on buildings, on materials management, which just looks at waste and on energy. And we're also gonna have a working group that looks on equity and engagement. Now equity is baked into each one of those working groups already. And, but what we have heard from the community and, and quite frankly, I mean, the reason we're having this conversation right now is that it has reached a national level and there's so much more that we can do in Houston and so much more in terms of building those relationships and those networks that we know we really need to be able to um, continue the success and momentum of the climate action and the resilience plan. So I want to invite anyone who is listening to this right now to please go to our website, it's greenhoustontx.gov and, and sign up for implementation. Um, because again, we are only as strong as our network and we need as many community partners as we possibly can. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Okay, jumping right into Doug and I see some really great questions coming through so hopefully we'll still have a couple minutes at the end of this. Okay, so um, There we go. So thank you all. Um, I'll be really, really brief. Uh, there's not much, much time. Um, it, it's great to hear all these other cities and, and the work you're doing. And the thing that's really interesting is there's just so much overlap um, already. Uh, you know, a lot of what we're doing is what, what, what all these other cities are doing. And um, the, the other thing I'll say is there's no easy answer to this. No city has, has solved this. Every city needs to, to find their own way. Um, I also want to say um, how amazing is it that you know there's other cities in Texas that have climate plans. You know, I think that's a you know it's a huge uh, accomplishment, um, and it's really showing that that Texas is um, really getting engaged in, in this um, this movement. Um, the other thing that's really important to to realize is uh, this is an opportunity. Um, COVID-19, um, all of the racial equity discussions, the recession. Um, you know, in our community, as, as well as around the country, people are talking about race and equity. And, and it's an opportunity for sustainability and climate professionals to basically take what we've been working on for years and then translate that into the immediate response. Um, like other plans that, that have been discussed today, we cover mitigation, we cover adaptation, uh, 28 community strategies, 45 community adaptation strategies, it's a tremendous amount of work um, cutting across all aspects of our community. You know, when you start talking about equity, how do you implement this equitably? Um, how do you make sure that um, uh, you know, the decisions that are being made from the top um, don't um, uh, provide additional burden uh, on our community and, and help undo uh, historic burden? That's the real challenge that we're talking about at this point in time. Um, you know, uh, you know, Phoebe talked a little bit about the, the climate impacts. You know, it, we know what's going to happen. We're seeing it now. Um, in, in San Antonio, we broke two records a couple weeks ago, 107 degrees, 106 degrees. When you start looking at uh, end of century projections, it's going to be 10 degrees hotter 
Um, it's not going to cool off. Um, additional um, extreme weather, flooding, we know who that's going to impact. It's our most vulnerable and it's our communities of color. So what are we going to do? It's our responsibility. Um, our plan does uh, have a, a climate section. Um, one of the, the takeaways was being realistic as far as what your expectation is with your plan. We wanted to, we convened a climate equity group. We were going to come up with a definition. We were going to come up with a screening mechanism. We were going to use it during the entire plan's development. That didn't happen. Um, we spent months just talking about what climate equity means for our community. Um, and we were able to, at the end of the day, come up with a draft screening mechanism similar to, to Austin that starts looking at access and accessibility, affordability, health, cultural preservation. Um, it needs work. Um, and so basically it's in the plan. Um, uh, the goal is as we start moving forward with implementation and start convening additional groups to start talking about it, we start refining it. The, the, you know, like Austin, it's, we need to ask the questions before we take any action. It's not gonna solve all the problems, but um, if we can have that conversation to see how we can mitigate, that's the, that's the opportunity. Um, really briefly on community engagement, you know, our plan set goals to have a demographically representative um, process. Uh, we track demographics. Uh, the chart on the right, you can see really quickly, you know, out of about 8,000 surveys that we conducted in the community, you can see that um, the blue line is um, the census for San Antonio and the green line are the survey responses. So you can see that, you know, Hispanic and Latino responses were underrepresented and white responses were overrepresented. We need to do more work. And so what we had done was we basically um, developed a um, focused engagement activity where we had a, a climate equity fellow and some temporary workers who went out to very specific city council districts. Um, and those were selected based upon distressed community um, index, life expectancy, tree canopy, urban heat island, and flood. So getting into the neighborhoods and talking. And the one thing I'll just mention really quickly is this isn't a technology issue. Um, social media, websites, that's only going to get us so far. It's face-to-face -face conversations, and it's whether it's you or through trusted messengers, you got to get into the community and you have to document and um, uh, make sure you're tracking what you're doing. This is really the key of where we are right now. It's governance. You know, who implements this? Who makes the decision? And where does the power lie? And that's a whole conversation that we're still trying to figure out. Um, our plan calls for, um, by ordinance, the creation of two committees, a technical and community committee and a climate equity committee. Um, it's basically codified in the ordinance that this, you know, there, there's clear climate equity objectives. Um, and we're starting to try to incorporate climate, climate equity into just all of our um, processes. So in the application process for people who wanted to apply to these committees, there's a clear equity question. You know, what is your view on racial equity? Um, when you start reading those responses, you realize we've got a long way to go in a community. You know, maybe 5% of people had a good understanding of what it is that we're talking about. Um, a lot of people missed the boat. Um, a lot of people just avoided the question. So trying to incorporate equity into how we even select people for these committees. Um, we're also going through a real comprehensive equity analysis with our um, uh, Office of Equity um, just to make sure we have that representation. And, and what we're seeing is there's certain demographics that we traditionally don't um, engage well and who don't serve on boards and commissions. So making sure that we're really trying to figure out how do we overcome those barriers. The other thing, as per ordinance, we're requiring, uh, similar to Austin, um, there's racial equity training required for all of these um, uh, advisory committee members. Um, before they show up to the meeting, day one, they need to be oriented to why race is being discussed. We're also providing racial equity training for our own staff. And then we have brought on an equity consultant who's gonna help facilitate these advisory committee meetings. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's just about, you know, we don't have all the solutions at this point in time, but we're trying to have the conversations. We're trying to um, uh, incorporate equity into just standard city processes. Um, so it's being highlighted. Um, and I think, and that's it. And so one, one of the things I would just say is if this is a journey um, and we're, I, I think it's always um, uh, being open to learning how to do these things better. And the, and the last thing I'll say is, what we don't want to do is we don't want this to be driven by the city or the Office of Sustainability. This is about having the community drive the conversation and drive the decisions. They can define what climate equity means. They need to identify, help identify what the metrics and measures are 
Um, and we need to start giving them more power in the decision making because it can't be a top down approach. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Doug. Yeah, I um, we when we had our planning call for for these presentations today, there was so much good information that I wanted to include everyone, but I realized an hour it was maybe a little ambitious. So let's try and get through a couple questions and then as i mentioned our speakers um, contact information will be shared so hopefully if you have specific contacts questions um we'll get to this so um sarah uh denton i believe um asked a question about are you continuing to collaborate with your community development departments to ensure your department is continuing to address equity issues and also what performance measures are you using to measure success in your department looking for specific measures and accomplishment, not general goals. And that's open. I don't know, maybe if y'all want to go in the order that we um, presented in, maybe if you want to start. Sure. Um, so yes, uh, you know, other departments in the city were heavily involved in our process with our advisory groups and some representation in our steering committee as well. And so we are going to have to continue and that, that's part of the, you know, the lessons learned is how can we across departments, um, you know, center equity um, in the same ways in our engagement processes? How can we make sure that our data collection is streamlined? Um, and so that ties back to measuring success. Um, you know, we can measure success, you know, based on carbon data, you know, this is how much, you know, percentage reductions we've seen over time. But we also need to make sure to um, have qualitative measures as far as, um, you know, quality of life in impacts um, for, from a quantitative angle as far as health outcomes, um, housing outcomes, etc. But we also need to talk to people and, and see, you know, what are your perceptions? What have you seen improved in your life? How can we best help? And so it really has to be a mix of how um, we're going to be looking at this data. You know, we need to have the data to, to um, and the numbers to drive that conversation, but we also need to continue to collect stories and collect um, feedback in that way. And so it has to be a dual approach and that's definitely something uh, we've had a lot of conversations and we'll be focused on. Many of the other cities have um, specific quantified goals. Yeah, I can mention really quickly what what we're doing. And again, COVID-19 sort of killed us uh, with a lot of our momentum. Um, but what we're currently doing right now is um, we are going department by department, um, developing um, consistency documents where we basically take a look at what what's in the plan um, related to each department and beginning to have conversations around them. Uh, and, and just making sure that they're starting to think about alignment. Um, in terms of the equity side, uh, our Office of Equity is going department by department, also making sure that um, uh, they're, they're considering equity in their work as well. Okay, anyone else wanna comment on these two? There, there's one question that's kind of a pet question. Laura, did you have- I was just gonna say, that uh, we recognize that accountability and tracking is a challenge because again, if the goal is carbon neutral by 2050, um, you have to have some interim goals and that the community really wants to see physical action. And when you're talking about energy, electrons are invisible and so it's hard. And so we built in targets um, that are physical things, but they also were specifically designed to um, be something that we can deploy equitably throughout the community so that we can measure it in terms of geographic implementation as well as just numbers. So it's things like miles of bike lane, it's the implementation of the of Vision Zero to ensure that as we do build out a more robust multimodal transit system that it's safe and actually accessible to the rest of our community. And we have targets for number of, numbers of solar panels, um, constructed throughout the community, um, as well as metrics around recycling and um, other things that we try to hear so that people can actually see and feel and understand. But seeing that reward loop of implementation is crucial. Great. Well, with that, we are actually at time. Um, there is a, uh, there's another question out there having to do with state policy, which I think is a great conversation to have, but unfortunately it's gonna to have to be for another time. 
So thank you again. Um, look out for the follow-up email. Thank you to our speakers so much and for all the work that you're doing out there and to all the cities on the call. Thank you for your continued work and leadership. All right, guys. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Yeah.